programs, Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Indonesia, which will update us regarding the current trends in FAA aeroscope medicine, as well as, well as human factor research. Lastly, I would like to convey my sincere welcome and thank, thank you to Dr. Melcher J. Antuyano for his time and effort for joining us today. I hope that through occasions such as these institutions of Faculty of Medicine could develop a greater bond and indulge in many academic collaborations. I also look forward to the change of seeing and hearing from you directly in person when the condition permits. Once again, thank you for all of you who have attended today. Thank you for your attention. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Professor Ari. Next, we will have another opening speech from the President of Indonesian Aerospace Medical Doctors Association, Dr. Dr. Wawan Mulyawan. Dr. Wawan, you may please commence the speech. Thank you, Dr. Adis, for giving me an uh, opportunity to give an uh, opening speech. Uh, first of all, I want to thanks to Dr. Meso Antunano, my friend. Yeah, we, we met at the uh, Bresen, uh, Hungary last two years ago. Uh, this very good meeting at that time and we can talk each other at the time and I think today will be one of the uh, starting point we can make a collaboration with your institution from the civil aviation uh, medical institute uh, in USA uh, precisely in Oklahoma City uh, previously, you also asked me to send some doctors to Oklahoma to join a toxicology course at the time, but then COVID-19 comes and we have to halt uh, the uh, sending uh, participation from Indonesia. So once again, I thanks to you to uh, everything that you can share your uh, knowledge, your experience to us in Indonesian uh, Aerospace uh, Doctor Association, and hope we will have uh, some uh, official agreement or some collaboration in the next future so we can uh, share yeah. together all the things in aerospace medicine. Once again, thank you, Dr. Melchor Antunano, and to all participants. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, Dr. Wawan, for the speech. Now, um, before we continue, we would like to take screenshot pictures of today's guest lecture participants. So we want to kindly ask everyone to please turn on your video camera for the shoot and operator to please wait for my mark for the screenshots. Okay. All right. Okay, everyone, will you please kindly turn on the video camera? Okay, I see some very pretty and handsome faces this morning. <laughs> All right. Okay, um, operator, please take the first picture for the first page. Okay, on my mark, one, two, three. Okay. Next, for the second picture, operator, ready? Okay, one, two, three. All right, thank you. For the third page, okay, operator, ready? One, two, and three. Next, for the fourth page, okay, ready? One, two, and three. And the last fifth page, ready? One, two, and three. Okay, operator, thank you. Thank you, everyone. You may turn off your video camera again or you may leave it turned on, it's fine. So right now, we have now entered the scientific session of the guest lecture. But before that, I would like to read our moderator's curriculum vitae for today, um, who is Dr. Tessa Apriesta. Operator, please kindly um, upload the PowerPoint. Oh. 
sorry, I was unmuted. Okay, so um, can everyone? Okay, everyone listen. Okay, good. So Dr. Tessa graduated from Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Kristen Indonesia, Jakarta, for his medical degree, and he obtained his degree in aerospace medicine specialty from Faculty of Medicine, Universitas Indonesia in Jakarta. Um, prior in obtaining his aerospace medicine degree, he served as a doctor in Moon on High. Ohai Tadiun Primary Healthcare and Karel Subsui Tubun Langur General Hospital in Tuwal, Southeast Molukas. From 2012 to 2016, he was a medical doctor at 118 Emergency Ambulance Foundation. From 2015 to August 2018, he was a medical officer at Ross Medical Karya. And from August 2016 to May 2019, he was a clinical manager and aviation medicine specialist at PT America Rescue International Medivac Asia. So you can see that he has very many experience in medical evacuation. And now currently, Dr. Tessa is a CEO at PT Savannah Assistance International or Savannah Assistance. I would like to invite Dr. Tessa to moderate the session. Please, Dr. Tessa, you may proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adis. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adis. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semuanya. Shalom. So, uh, welcome to today's guest lecture with the topic Current Trends in FAA Aerospace Medicine and Human Factor Research. And we are pleased to have you join us and take part in today's session. And in, or, in, in order to co be considerate and respectful to our speaker and everyone attending today, all attendees are muted, but don't worry, we will have time for discussion after the presentation. And you also may submit questions at any time during the session using the chat feature. And I am pleased to introduce Dr. Melchor J. Antoniano, who has joined us today from halfway across the globe. Uh, hello, good morning, uh, good evening, Dr. Antoniano. Uh, allow me to introduce you to our attendee today. So everyone, Dr. Antoniano was born in Mexico City and is a graduate of the National Autonomous University of Mexico School of Medicine. He completed the residency program in aerospace medicine at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. He was awarded a postdoctoral research associateship by the U.S. National Research Council of the National Academy of Sciences at the USAF School of Aerospace Medicine in San Antonio, Texas. He is currently the director of the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration, FAA, Civil, Civil Aerospace Medical Institute, Kemi in Oklahoma City. He is credited with 929 professional presentations and invited lectures at national and international conferences in aerospace medicine in 41 countries. Maybe this is your uh, 42, 42nd year, no? And with 65 scientific publications covering a variety of aerospace medicine topics. He is past president of the International Academy of Aviation and Space Medicine, the Aerospace Medical Association, the Space Medicine Association, and the Ibero-American Association of Aerospace Medicine. He is a fellow of the Aerospace Medical Association and the Aerospace Human Factors Association. He is honorary member of the Austrian, Brazilian, Colombian, Greek, Mexican, Peruvian, Slovenian, and Turkish societies of aviation aerospace medicine. He is a member of the International Academy of Astronautics. He is a faculty member at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston and the National University of Columbia School of Medicine. He is a former faculty member at Wright State University School of Medicine. And Dr. Antoniano has received 85 awards of, and recognition for his academic administrative and research achievement, including Dot Secretary's Award for Meritorious Achievement Silver Medal, granted by the Secretary of the U.S. DOT, and the J. Pardis uh, FES Champion of Safety Awards, granted by the FAA Office of Aviation Safety for significant contributions 
to the promotion of global aviation safety. The Life Sciences Award, granted by the International Academy of Astronautics for significant contribution to the advancement of the astronautical sciences. The Louis H. Bauer Founders Award, granted by the Aerospace Medical Association for the most significant contribution in aerospace medicine. The Won Chil K Award, granted by the Aerospace Medical Association for outstanding contribution to international aerospace medicine. The Eric Wilgen Kranz Award, granted by the Aerospace Medical Association for excellence as an educator in aerospace medicine. And Dr. Antonio Noah also has experience as a private pilot, scuba diver, and parachutist. Okay, that's the Dr. Antonio Noah's CV. And now we will tune into your lecture, Doctor. If you could start sharing your screen, please. Thank you very much. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, we, are. Uh, okay. we can see. Well, okay. first thing, I want to express my sincere appreciation to all of you, in particular, Dr. Wawan, for inviting me to participate. I have never been in Indonesia, but I consider this a great opportunity, at least. Finally, I'm speaking to an audience in Indonesia, and that's going to make a big difference, and is the beginning of many other things that we can do together. It is, uh, as you know, aerospace medicine is a specialty that is not as big as other specialties, but we have the opportunity to get to know each other internationally. So once again, thank you very much. It is not only a pleasure, but it is an honor to have been invited to participate in, in this conference. So I'm going to share with you some of what's going on related to research at uh, the FAA in the Civil Aerospace Medical Institute in both aerospace medicine and aerospace human factors. And uh, first I want to share with you just a little bit. This is uh, the front of the Institute. Uh, we have our own airplane right there. It doesn't fly anymore, but it's a piece of aviation history. Uh, we are part of a very large facility called the Mike Monroe Aeronautical Center. We have about 5,000 employees here and we have about 110 buildings and the Institute is right there that is circled. So here is where all the training for air traffic controllers takes place in the United States. You see that building there on the left. That's where the Institute is. And then we have a transportation safety Institute where we do the accident investigation courses. We have our own aircraft fleet. So very, very extensive operation that is here. And here just to show you that uh, the way we are organized is my boss is the federal air surgeon, Dr. Susan Northrop. I report directly to her as director. And under my leadership, I have five divisions. The medical certification division that covers the medical certificates for 520,000 civilian pilots in the United States. We have an aerospace medical education division. And that's why I was telling you that you can come here and get some training. Then we have two research divisions, aerospace human factors, an aerospace medical research division. And the last one is an occupational health division. So we have about 215 employees and 80 contract employees and all of these, and I'm not going to go in detail, but these are the different backgrounds of the people who are working for us here at the Institute. And we have a very large facility. So because of the scope that we do, we have many different areas, professional areas and scientific areas of, uh, with uh, specialists. And our mission as FAA, of course, is to provide the safest, most efficient and aerospace, aerospace system in the world. And it says aerospace because we FAA not only uh, deal with aviation, we also deal with commercial space transportation. So what you have been seeing lately of these commercial space flights, we regulate commercial space operations in the United States as well. So we actually, as an institute, we deal with the human being. And why? Because the human being is really the weak link in the operation. Technology has advanced very fast. So now the, really the limitations that we have in aerospace activities is the tolerances and limitations of the human body. That's where the limitation is. So, but let me start talking about research. And this is across the agency. Across the agency, we have research in several domains. We have one that is related, for example, to aircraft safety. So research in connection with the aircraft research in connection with specific digital systems and technologies that are used for communications, navigation, all kinds of things. Then we have also research in connection with the environment and the, the, where operations are taking place. Everything related to airport, 
then also relate to air traffic. And that's where we have aviation performance and planning. So a lot of research going in that area. And this is where we are. We actually cover aeromedical and human factors research. And that's because we're interested, as I said, in the human side of the operation. So it's the typical human factors, which is the relationship between the human, the machine, and the environment. But it is not only from a perspective of the pilot, like you see on the left side, and all of the limitations or all the things that could happen to the pilot, but also to other people who are involved with aerospace operations. And you have, for example, maintenance personnel, you have air traffic controllers, you have even the people who design the aircraft, you have the people who are involved with management. Why? Because that can also lead to potential incidents and accidents. So we call it the human in the loop. We're involved with that. And here, just to give you an idea of our capabilities. And at the Institute in both areas, aeromedical and human factors research, we have the capabilities to do all of these different areas of research that you see around in connection with passengers and aircraft, in connection with the air crew, and in connection with air traffic control. So that doesn't mean that every year we're doing research in every one of these areas, but we actually have done, and as you, I'm going to share with you, we continue to do research. For example, uh, issues related to radiation exposure coming from the sun and coming from also galactic cosmic radiation. Yeah, research related to drones, to commercial space transportation. Here is more on the control stations for unmanned aerial systems. As we were chatting before the conference, uh, activities and research related to biochemistry and toxicology, equipment for ditching and survival. Then we have passenger safety and egress, all of these different areas. So I'm going to emphasize a couple of these. Not, I'm not going to cover all of them, but for example, one of the newest areas for us is genomics. We are doing research on gene expression that we became the pioneers in the world to start using uh, DNA, excuse me, RNA and uh, gene expression research for accident investigation purposes. And I will share that with you. Another one is also that we have developed in conjunction with a university in Italy, University of Udine, we have developed telephone, cell phone apps, essentially professional games. And through games, now people are learning, for example, how to evacuate an aircraft, most people, most passengers don't pay attention to the flight attendants in flight, but they, they play games. So that's why we have gone in that direction. So let me jump and share with you some of the specific projects. So in aerospace medicine research, as of this week, we presented a new list of the things that we're working this year, next year, and the year after that. So we are looking at medical certification of pilots. That's what is called airmen in the US with neurological and psychiatric conditions. Why? Because those pathologies are increasing. Also, the performance-based medical certification of pilots with COPD, particularly because of pilots who used to smoke and they have uh, COPD. Well, how can we recertify them? Then risk-based aeromedical certification. What does that mean? Depending upon your medical problem, what is the risk that you may develop an incapacitation in flight? And that's what we are trying to do some research to identify the different risk levels depending upon the medical condition. Then of course, uh, issues about fatigue, a lot of research going there and I will expand a little bit on that. Then the forensic, and that means after we obtain the remains of pilots who die in accidents, we look at illegal drugs, alcohol, and also medications. Then this is a new one, the medical recertification of pilots with prior COVID-19 infection. Why? Because we want to know for those who develop sequela or long-term consequences, how are we going to return them to fly? Then this one, as a result of COVID-19 with our aviation medical examiners, we're not even meeting with pilots to do physical exams. Well, we started looking at how can we do a remote medical certification exam using new uh, telemedicine technology. So that's another of, of research. The same thing with cabin health and safety during an epidemic. And that has to do with protection of the occupants. Well, what's the level of risk? For example, right now, if you fly in an airline aircraft, but you fly as a passenger, depending upon the location where you are, depending upon the type of passenger. So we're looking at those things. Another area is a cabin air quality. And that has been an interest internationally. Uh, issues now we have with passengers. Passengers who are having bad behavior, who are 
causing problems. So we are interested in identifying what are the, the reasons for that kind of behavior. Then also occupant safety during adverse events. For example, if you have an incident, how are people responding to that? Are they following instructions or not? Are they following the signs or not? Then we have also how to improve crash protection in helicopters. That's where we have most accidents now in the United States, in helicopters and particularly in air ambulance helicopters. Then we're also looking at the effect of cabin interior consideration, the design, the, uh, the, uh, all of the equipment, including the rafts and everything, and how does that impact the emergency evacuation and then the survival once you are outside. And let me jump to another area. So now going more specific, we, are, we started research on smoke, odors, and fumes in aircraft. Why? Because flight attendants are complaining that sometimes the smells on board the aircraft are affecting their health and their performance. So there is, a, there is an effort right now to see if we could establish sensors or put sensors in aircraft and identify what kind of uh, substances are the ones that are producing some of these smoke, odor, and fumes. Then this is one study that was mandated by, the, by Congress in the United States that essentially they wanted us to determine if the size of airplane seats has an implication on how fast you can evacuate an aircraft. And if, for example, you're in first class, those are very big seats, then you have business class, but then you have coach class. Well, does the seat size ha have an impact or no, or has an impact or no on evacuation? And so far we determined that right now, all of the seats in all different types of aircraft, they actually do not affect emergency evacuation. So they are all equally safe at this point in time. I mentioned to you that we're doing research related to space radiation, solar radiation. So we're constantly monitoring the sun. That's a satellite between the sun and earth. It's called Go Satellite. That information goes to another federal agency. They send that to us. And we are constantly monitoring radiation. And if there is a problem with radiation, we actually change altitudes and headings of aircraft to protect aircraft components, but also to protect the occupants of the aircraft. And that happens every single year, particularly in transcontinental flights, or for example, flights between Asia and, United, and America, or between America and Europe, uh, sometimes we change altitudes and headings to prevent exposure to radiation in flight. Uh, I mentioned to you that we are having the largest number of accidents in the US have to do with helicopters. Well, that's why we have research going on with systems to protect the occupants in helicopters. So we actually have our crash dummy testing facility. So we do what is called crash testing here at the Institute for different configurations for helicopter aircraft. And we started doing some in connection with space capsules and spacecraft. So we are actually develop at the Institute here in Oklahoma City, the first instrumented crash dummies available in the world in the late 1950s, early 1960s. So now we're in the latest generation of crash dummies. We're also looking at the effects of medications on human performance at altitude. <laughs> So different kinds of medications, because what we are seeing, at least here in the United States, we have most of the federal accidents are in general aviation, private pilots, okay? And the number one drug that we are finding when we analyze the tissues, the specimens of the pilots is pseudoephedrine. And that essentially is a common medication that is part of the over-the-counter medications that you don't need a prescription from a doctor to treat uh, upper respiratory infections. And what, what's, that, what's one of the problems with pseudoephedrine? That it causes uh, drowsiness. You become a little bit sleepy as a side effect. So that's not good for pilots. That's not good for anybody in a safety sensitive function. So we can do a research related to our altitude chamber, related to our other facilities that I will share with you later on. Then also doing research on emergency evacuation equipment from big aircraft, but also trying to standardize the design of the slides and try to make sure that they are all appropriate to facilitate evacuation during an emergency. And as I mentioned to you, we, are, we have been doing a lot related to the crash zones. And now the idea is that 
how can we harmonize? How can we standardize the construction of these crash dummies, but internationally? So that when do, we do research in different countries, we actually use the same equivalent of crash dummy. Like you can see, we're very interested in the pelvis area to standardize that. Also issues about the spine injury criteria. Why? Because that's where we have many of the the consequences on emergency evacuation if you injure your back, if you injured your, your spine. So a lot of effort going into that one. Also, we are looking at biomarkers of fatigue and how can we do fatigue mitigation. So we are doing gene expression. And what that means is we're looking at the changes in RNA as a result of being tired. And we want to know if after you die, based on remains, based on uh, specimens from your body after you die, could we measure the presence of fatigue using RNA after you die? So that's going to revolutionize forensic medicine. We're looking at that right now. So we're also looking at how can we expand conditions, medical conditions that instead of us in the FAA making the final decision on whether or not that pilot should be certified, why don't we delegate more authority to our designated aviation medical examiners so that they can make the final de decision in that case instead of coming to us? And this is another big project going on right now uh, for cognitive testing of pilots. We have something called COG screen, and that's been used in many countries, not only us. But now the question came to us: why should, should we only have COG screen? Why not? have other neurocognitive testing protocols that we can use and that they are equivalent to, to let us know if there are any problems. And just think about the practical aspect. Right now, how do we know the neurological consequences of COVID-19, the neurological effects of COVID-19 on pilots after they were infected? Well, we would like to do, and we would have to do some kind of neurocognitive testing to determine if COVID-19 affected their neurologic performance or their cognitive performance. So that's why we're interested in all of these things. Now, I want to share with you about the facilities themselves. Here are some of our aerospace medicine research facilities. This is our toxicology lab that we have one of the best toxicology labs in the country where we're actually developing our, also our own procedures. We look every time we receive the remains of a pilot and we receive about two fatal accidents per day somewhere in the United States. So we analyze those remains every single day. So we're looking for hundreds of illegal drugs, medications, and alcohol to see what's present in those samples after the pilots die. Then this is the equipment that we use for gene expression analysis. Here you have our impact testing crash dummies. One of the first ones is the one that you see there, that's the skeleton of a crash dummy. Now different generations, the new, the new crash dummies Actually, you have sensors that simulate individual organs inside the entire uh, dummy. So now we can see what's the impact of a crash on the entire body, but also the different impact on the organs inside that crash dummy. For different sizes, we have for women, we have for men, we have equivalent of infants, newborns, all of them. And this is the impact testing facility that we have. So we can actually accelerate this platform up to 60 times, six zero, 60 times the force of gravity. So we can actually do very, very strong impacts. And just to give you a comparison, if you're driving your car at five miles per hour and you crash against a wall, that generates about three Gs. We're looking at 60 Gs. Why? Because we're looking at how can we protect the occupants by better design of seats, better designs of restraint systems, including the seat belts. And that's why we do the testing. Here's an example of one of those tests that here we're looking at, these are the new seats that they have to tolerate 16 Gs, one six, 16. That's a new standard for all commercial aircraft around the world. Yes, you could have potentially a minor injury to your face, but it's actually survivable. 
And then you would not have an injury to your face if you put your arms against the back of the seat in front of you, and then you put your forehead against of the back of seat, and that way you don't move your body and you don't get hurt. So we look also at the infant restraint systems, car seats. Now what we have been testing, and in fact, now they are already being installed in aircraft, is airbags that deploy from seat belts. So now new 737s, new Airbus 320s, Boeing 787s, even Boeing 777s, now, many of them are already being bought with airbags that are built into the seat belts. And the way you know is because it, is, it looks kind of bulky. So you know that you have your air, own airbag. So if you have an airbag, now if you crash and you are standing and you are sitting upright, even if you move forward, now you are not going to injure your face or injure your neck because the bag is going to protect you. And those have already been saving people's lives. So for that we use, well, we have also our flex simulator. In this aircraft, we can put up to 150 people. We can make it move in different directions, elevate it up to 20 feet, simulate that it's taking off, simulating that it's turning, and then simulate the final crash position. So that way we can do research on emergency evacuation procedures and then equipment for emergency evacuation. And for example, you don't see windows outside but we have windows inside. Well, because now we have computer generated images. So that for example, if you crash and we want them to see that there is fire outside the aircraft through the windows, we're going to sh show them flames. Or if they crash into water, we're going to show them waves. So very, very unique facility. And then that's where we completed this study that I shared with you that was mandated by Congress. So here is just to show you an example of a good way of evacuating an aircraft where you actually jump your arms in front of you, and then you evacuate, no problem. But if you don't pay attention to the instructions, then you can do something like this, where now the slide becomes a trampoline. So you have to pay attention and you have to evacuate the, the airplane correctly. So that's part of the research that we do. Here's for example, just to show you that in a real eva evacuation, how competitive people try to get out at the same time. And this is what happens in real accidents, even though this is research that we do here. In, a, in this study that we did with 3000 people, we had in some cases up to seven people trying to get out at the same time through the same door. So we have to come up with procedures. Here you see on the right side, once again, many people try to do it. At the same time. So we also have our Boeing 747 that doesn't fly anymore. We use it for emergency evacuation research, for cabin safety research, also for safety, other safety aspects of research and security aspects of research. So we have that one also next to our building. Then we have another uh, fuselage that we use for aircraft fire research so that we can actually come up with different techniques on how to extinguish a fire inside the aircraft. We have our altitude chambers. We have one for training. We have one for research. The one for research, we can take it to an altitude of 85,000 feet. Just to put it in perspective, usually in an airplane like a Boeing 787, Airbus 350, your maximum altitude is about 45,000 feet. We can take these chambers to 80,000 feet so that we can test new equipment and also test suits, like for example, for commercial space flight. But now for training purposes, we can use also a portable reduce oxygen training chamber. In this case, you don't change the pressure. What you do is just manipulate the, the concentration of gases between nitrogen and oxygen. And by doing that, you can simulate any altitude. So that's a good way of teaching, but also it's a good way of doing research because it's very practical and you can mount it anywhere. Then we have also, we actually developed at the Institute the first special disorientation simulator to teach pilots what happens to the illusions that they experience in flight. So then over the years, we have had now different designs and new designs of simulators up to the latest one on the bottom right. And then we have also the only one of its kind in the world, which is a special disorientation simulator for helicopter pilots, because some of the illusions that they experience are unique because of the type of flying in helicopters. We also have a polar chamber because we do research and we do train related to exposure to environment. So we can simulate polar conditions here, and then we can develop specifications and recommendations for protective equipment and for procedures on how to actually uh, survive 
if you have to land in a very cold environment. We also have our water survival facility, which is uh, which we use for both for research and for training on different procedures, different type of flotation devices. What can we do to increase the, the survivability if you have to go into the water? So this is our old facility. This goes back to 1960. We're in the process. In fact, we started last October to build a brand new facility that will be the size of a swimming pool. We will be able to submerge aircraft and even spacecraft. We will be able to produce up to 10 foot waves to produce wind speeds up to 12 miles an hour to simulate rain. So it will be a very, very unique facility that we're going to finish in 2024. So this will be something special that hopefully you will get the chance to see it and experience it if you come here for training. So as you can see here, I mean, simulating everything from waves to wind to everything, and then even turn off all the lights to simulate that this happens at night. So now let me jump to aerospace human factor research. And in aerospace human factor research, we have research on advanced vision systems, newer cockpit with new instrumentations with head up displays like this one, with head mounted displays like this one. And now the issue is that if you have information provided to the pilot, but that it is not real, real images, but these computer generated images, just like what you see out here, is that the same or not? So we're talking about synthetic vision systems, enhanced vision systems, and now combined vision systems. So a lot of research going into this area. Why? Because the next generation of aircraft may also have, for example, virtual reality, may also have a combination of uh, these enhanced vision systems, but also with head mounted displays and other things that I will show you later. We're also doing in human factors, risk-based decision-making, and particularly this applies to maintenance of aircraft. What kinds of accidents or incidents are because of mistakes caused by mechanics, by maintenance personnel, and how can we prevent some of those mistakes? So that's the reason for this human factors research. Also from the human factors perspective, what about fatigue research, not from a physiological point of view, but now from the point of view of the schedules for pilots, all of the ways that pilots are being operating, operating uh, particularly ultra long flights. Like if you were right now, we go from America to Indonesia, you can have very, very long flights, 14, 15, 16 hours. So what's the implications when you have multi-segment operations, long range and ultra long range? Now we have flights up to 20 hours in flight. So yes, we have two crews, but then we have to determine if they still get tired or not. Then emerging flight systems. And, and that means new technologies that are coming, both for general aviation, for commercial aviation, making sure that the design is compatible with the human, that there is a good human machine interface. And even uh, uh, things as simple as, for example, using electronic flight bags, in, using iPads, using iPhones, using all of these portable devices, digital devices, in order to increase safety, but also to facilitate flight inspection, okay? I mentioned to you already about helicopter ambulance accidents. Most of them happen during final approach to landing and landing or during takeoff because in many cases, air ambulance operations happen in remote areas where they are landing just anywhere. So it's not just heli heliports. Then also we are doing more research on how to optimize air traffic control training. As a result of COVID-19, we started doing research on well, since they couldn't come to the classroom, could we use games or could we use more computer-based training for air traffic controllers so that we can continue training whether or not we have infectious problems like COVID-19? Also doing research on remote tower systems. And you may not have heard about this one, but now, and that started in Europe and we're doing it now in one of our locations in the United States. But now there are virtual towers. So instead of a real air traffic control tower, you could have in a basement anywhere, a room where you have information coming from high definition cameras at the real airport. This is actually the one, one of the ones in uh, Stockholm in uh, Europe, where what they are seeing is an airport located 100 miles away, but they are controlling traffic from the distance 
like if they were inside the tower. So we have a five-year plan that we are still looking at human factors research, uh, human factors issues into virtual air traffic controllers or remote towers. Then also the integration. When we have now UAVs, when we have aircraft, when we have spacecraft, and I'm going to show you some other things that we have more and more challenges. Well, how do we integrate them all and they continue to be safe? And then also technology integration and training requirements. For example, we started using our already uh, head mounted displays with virtual reality goggles for maintenance operations. In this case, instead of virtual reality, it's augmented reality that you can superimpose on what you are seeing, like for example, the engine or the component of the aircraft. You see manuals, you see additional information from the manuals that you want to present to the mechanic. Well, what about applying these to other areas like air traffic control, also to flying an aircraft? So on the research facilities that we're using for human factor research, this is one of them, the Advanced General Aviation Research Simulator, that we can change the configuration of instruments because all of these are digital instruments. They are not uh, analog instruments. We have a very light jet simulator that we can either doesn't move, it's just the image that is high definition. So it gives you a sensation of, of more motion. You, we can put a, a, like in this case, a very light jet simulator, or you can, we can move in a helicopter and do research related to that as well. And as you can see, we have been doing research related to monitors, related to other equipment on board the aircraft and uh, helicopters. Then this is part of the research to try to decrease the number of uh, fatal accidents in air ambulance operations. Why don't we give to helicopter pilots, civilian helicopter pilots, particularly in air ambulance operations, head mounted displays where through the displays, we show them the obstacles. So that now they are not going to hit trees. They are not going to hit electric cables. They are not going to hit other structures on the ground. So that research is going very well. So other head up displays, in this case was head mounted display, but also we're doing research on head up displays not only to be used in flight, but also on the ground when you have bad weather and things like that. So try to make the assessment from a human factors point of view so that you can actually show. And then ultimately, why don't we project all of the information directly into the eye so that you don't need an external display? The display becomes your own retina inside your eye. So that, that would be probably the future. And this is one of our new simulators. We're exploring other ways of controlling aircraft. Can you fly an aircraft by using voice? Can you fly an aircraft by just using your eyesight? So for example, if you want to lower the landing gear, you look at the lever from the, for the landing gear right here and just blink your eyes and that's going to activate the landing gear. Or also control with hands, gesture in your hands, just moving your hands. But now the latest thing is that I'm creating an incentive to my investigators to look at a brain computer interface. And that is technology that is happening already for other areas, for example, in medicine for prosthetic control, that instead of having myoelectrically controlled prosthetics, why don't you control that by thinking, thinking about it, thinking what you want to do? Well, what about the same thing? There are already prototypes of systems where you can actually uh, do, man do maneuvers on an aircraft by an interface that is a brain computer interface. And you just think and by thinking that information goes to the airplane and the airplane does it, okay? So let me jump that. So where, where are we going? Where are we as an institute going? Well, we are pioneering new technologies. We are also pioneering procedures and scientific developments. We are, of course, contributing thousands of research reports and scientific articles to the scientific literature, both in the medical and human factors areas. And as you know, so with our teaching facility, but also flight simulators, we're renewing our infrastructure to have the latest and greatest equipment so that we can continue doing innovative research. So now let me jump here to another area. What are the challenges and opportunities related to new transportation technologies? And now I'm going to share with you some of the new things. Like for example, the newest wide body transport aircraft. This is the Boeing 787. It has been flying now for several years. But from an aeromedical point of view, this airplane and also the Airbus 350 are different. You have a full composite fuselage, which means no aluminum. So since you don't have a metal body, now you can increase relative humidity inside so that it's more comfortable for the passengers. 
Most passengers will complain about upper respiratory symptoms in other aircraft, but that's because the air is too dry. And why don't we increase the, uh, the humidity in other aircraft that have aluminum structure? Because that could lead to water condensation and that could affect electrical systems. But if you have a composite fuselage, then you can increase humidity and there is no condensation of water vapor. This airplane also produces less noise. Each window is a little bit bigger, about a fourth uh, in dimension bigger than other, other windows. You can control the color, and I will tell you the, the, uh, in, a, in a minute the, the emphasis on colors. But now instead of having a, sh a blind or a shape, if you want to control the amount of light coming to, to the window in front of you, now instead of that, you have photochromic windows, where by just pushing a switch right there, it goes from, from completely opaque to completely transparent. So that's new technology that didn't exist before. Now about the colors, the, you are seeing more and more colors in aircraft. And the reason for that is psychological and also the perception of comfort. So for example, if you, you are seeing more and more of the blues because the blue colors calm people down. If you want them to go to sleep, you want to use blue light. If uh, people are anxious, also different shades of, of blue. If you want them to be alert, then you change the color palette to all uh, other colors. But then that gives you the flexibility to create different comfort zones on board the aircraft by just manipulating color. So uh, if you have people who are you know, getting irritable, well, you can actually also control some of that behavior or stress by uh, manipulating the colors. And actually that was based on some research done also by NASA that led to also using color on board the space shuttle, on board the International Space Station, and even on the stations of the space controllers on the ground. So what I share with you about the Airbus, uh, the Boeing 787, or also similar about the Airbus uh, 350. So from, from an aeromedical point of view, here's another difference. With these two aircraft, instead of flying at a cruise altitude of 40,000 feet, now you fly to around 45,000 feet, which is higher altitude, less turbulence. But then, because it's full composite fuselage, instead of having a cabin pressure inside the aircraft, any, other, or any of the other aircraft in the fleet with aluminum, if you're flying at 40,000 feet, inside the aircraft is about maximum 8,000 feet. But at 8,000 feet, some people are already getting the physiological effects of not enough partial pressure of oxygen. With these airplanes, the Airbus 350 and the Boeing 787, you can be flying at a higher altitude, but then you can maintain 5,000 feet cabin pressure, lower pressure than other aircraft. What that means, if you have, for example, patients, or you have passengers who may have respiratory problems, may have anemia, who may have other medical conditions that compromise oxygenation, this is the best type of aircraft, Airbus 350 and the Boeing 787 to fly, because they are more physiologically compatible aircraft. Best ones in that regard. Silent aircraft, that's another area because right now one of the big problems around the world is that many airports are in metropolitan areas. So now we're having an impact on the population of exposure of the population to noise. And that creates not only physiological effects, but also psychological issues and a lot of complaints. So there is an emphasis on the next generation of aircraft that will produce less noise and this particular design is called a blended body, is the future of quieter aircraft. Then we have what is called the urban air mobility or UAM systems, or also advanced air mobility, AAM. But essentially, what does that mean? It's like a big drone where now you put passengers on board. And what is going on right now in the industry, and for example, companies like Uber or Lyft, they want this type of transportation right now because they want to start transporting people in urban areas, metropolitan areas, using equipment like this one. And actually without a pilot, they want this to be automated systems or remotely controlled from the ground. Another area is occupant center aircraft designs. Like for example, this is from uh, Airbus saying that some people, many people like to experience the real flight experience so why not give them a transparent fuselage that could be done right now with the same material that I showed you before, the photochromic windows, that if you don't want to show anything, you turn it opaque. If you want to show the whole thing, then it's transparent. 
But you have to keep in mind that some people are afraid of flying and some people are afraid of heights. So they, they may not like to be in, a, in an airplane like this one. But also they are introducing new technologies. Why not utilize heat produced by the passengers? You collect that power to operate cabin facilities or other systems. Because right now, when we are flying and we're producing our own body heat, that gets wasted. Why not use some of that heat to convert it to electricity and power systems on board the aircraft? And here's a, oh, this is a close, uh, a close up of what I showed you that by activating that button right there, you can go to from mean dark to completely transparent. So that's in the Boeing 787 that's happening right now. Another area is very light jets, jets for one person, two persons, but to be used in the civilian environment. And there are many different designs. But what's the implication from a human factors perspective for us? That now instead of two pilot commercial operations, now we're going in the direction of a single pilot commercial operations, like for air taxis as well. So what that means is that now they have to be supplemented even more with more automated systems. And those automated systems have to be better designed to be compatible with human use. So all of these different types of aircraft. This is one of the newest ones that he's been tested as well, okay? From here, I go to hybrid aircraft. And here is, for example, the B-22 Osprey, which was a military version, now it's their civilian. And the civilian is the, the A-609, which has been developed in Italy. Initially, it was being developed in the United States and Italy, now it's just Italy. But we just had a meeting with them about three weeks ago. They want to get approval from the FAA within the next year. Then this is another version that is being pushed for military operations. It's a different type of design, which is also a hybrid vehicle, uh, where that essentially can take off as a helicopter, but then it can fly as an airplane, which means longer distances and faster speeds as opposed to helicopters. Then we go to unique aircraft types, including flying cars, flying motorcycles, flying trikes, then uh, something like this one, the aeromobile, in fact, we, we had a meeting with this, the, uh, the owner and the chief engineer of this company about a month and a half ago. They showed us where they are. They obtained already certifi certification for this vehicle in Slovakia. Uh, and now they want to obtain FAA certification to fly this sports flying car, okay? It's not the other one, the only one. We have one like the Sky Car. We have the, this is another one, Maverick Flying Car. This is one that is being developed in Europe, which is a hover bike. So with all of this, you have to think about several things. Number one, if they are pilots, should they be medically certified? Right now, by definition, they are not considered pilots. Legally, they are not. Now, if they're pilots and they have to be medically certified, is that an airplane? No, it is not. Is that an aircraft? Well, some kind of flying machine. So the regulations have to be modified in order to accommodate this. And here, what you see in this vehicle is that each of the wheels has a micro turbine. So when you use it as a motorcycle, well, yeah, it's like a normal commercial motorcycle. Once you're getting ready to fly, you flip them, and now you use the micro turbines to produce the lift. Here you have another design from Japan, you have one that was being tested by Boeing, but now Boeing just gave a $500 million contract to a company called Whisk to develop another one that will be on behalf of Boeing. Here's another one from Canada. Now, what about the next generation of lighter than air commercial transports? And here you have the next generation of blimps, balloons, that uh, will be more practical, will be easier to operate, cheaper to operate, flying higher. And for example, now is one of the problems with a blimp on the ground is that if you have it in a hangar, you need people to take it out with ropes. Once the, the, the vehicle is outside, then it goes flying and then you have to grab it again and put it back in the hangar. This vehicle has a hovercraft landing system. So now it can taxi on the ground. So the development keeps going on this one, which is the Martin P. 791, it started as a development for the US Army. The Army stopped that study, which was a prototype, but now the company continues that as a technology demonstrator because they want to commercialize it for civilian operations. But this is not the other one. This another one is called the Dragon Dream, and you can see the size of the vehicle. Personal flying machines, tons of them. 
from personal wings like this one to uh, different types of devices with micro turbines, name it, is being developed. So the same questions from our perspective, from an aerospace medicine, we have to think about all kinds of issues. We have to think about, of course, their medical qualifications, but then issues about equilibrium, issues about perceptions, issues like in this one, this one you're open, open, operating it, changing your center of gravity, so you have to be well coordinated, making sure that you don't have a pathology that will affect your equilibrium. But then at the same time, what about noise exposure? Should they have supplemental oxygen or not? The human machine interface, how easy to operate? What happens if something goes wrong? What's the, the, uh, the way to rescue a person like this one? Fortunately, now we have ballistically deployed parachutes that you can launch a parachute and that will bring the entire person and equipment down. This is another one that was being developed in New Zealand and just uh, two months ago, it was going in an excellent direction. In fact, it was going to obtain certification in New Zealand. They, uh, they were negatively impacted by COVID-19 and they went broke. So now it was bought by a Chinese company, this vehicle, and we don't know if that will continue development or not. This is one that is developed in um, Russia that is being tested here was in Dubai. But here, just to show you more details about that uh, Zapata flying boat, it has one, two, three, four micro turbines and you have the operators, the, the, the uh, controls on your hand. So once again, is the human machine interface, not only for the flying portion, but also the controls. How intuitive, how easy to operate. And if something goes wrong with this one, <laughs> you can just operate your parachute and that will bring you down. So here they actually, uh, this um, was crossing the English channel in a, one of these things. Now this one, it is a lot easier from the same company, but instead of, of a change in attitude with change of balance on your body, you just push the sticks and that's how you fly this thing. This is another one that is a JB9 with two micro turbines, uh, 10 minute flight. Well, that has been increased now with the JB10. And the latest one is the JB-11. The JB-11 can fly at speeds over 150 miles per hour, that many kilometers per hour, with six turbines. So once again, all of the aeromedical questions, all of the human factors issues, then of course, for the civil aviation authorities, the certification aspects of how they are going to allow these types of operations. Here's another one that probably you have seen in the Discovery Channel, these developments from the UK. Same thing. So this is another area that is impacting us around the world. More and more, starting with cargo operations, cargo companies want to eliminate the co-pilot and just fly with a single pilot. So now, are we okay, as far as safety is concerned, going to single pilot operations in large aircraft? We don't have them today, but can we go in that direction? We are being pushed and we are going to do it. But that means, for example, from a medical redundancy point of view, if you allow a pilot or a flight with two pilots and co-pilot, you have a backup system, which is the other person. But you, now if you have a single pilot, does that mean that you will be more restricted in what kind of medical waivers you can give because now it's just one pilot flying instead of two? So those are questions that we're asking ourselves. Plus you have to increase automation. So you have to have, from a human factors point of view, a better interface, but also a higher reliability of the systems and also better warnings for now a single pilot instead of two pilots, but that's happening. The urban adversary mobility systems here, I'm just going to show you more of these, but let me, oh, this is another one that I didn't show you, but this is the Volocopter that uh, here, the idea is also an air taxi, although this is being operated because it is a prototype right now. But the idea in this one is to make it remotely operated or completely automated flight. And as you can see, so many propellers. What about if they fail here from the center? You can deploy a ballistically deployed parachute that actually can bring the entire helicopter down with no problem for the occupants. So now they are working on a cargo version of this particular design. It's called the Cold Volatron. This is another one that I mentioned to you. Now, this is one from Israel. And from Israel, it has different implications. At this point, it was for remote sensors. 
why not modify one of these and to use it as a remotely controlled air ambulance where you do for air medical evacuation and you don't have to have a pilot on board. You just load the patient, then take it to the medical center or to the clinic where the person is going to be treated. So research is going there and there is a lot of interest there. Then from here, we jump to supersonic transport. We assume that the end of uh, supersonic transportation because of the Concorde, that's not true because there are developments going on. But what was the problem with the Concorde? That the Concorde would not fly over territory, over land. Why? Because when you break the sound barrier, you create shock waves when you break the sound barrier that those propagate to the ground and th those can cause damage to structures and those can also affect people on the ground. So, but how can we prevent that from happening? By different designs of noses. So this was one design, but an even better design is this one. And this was demonstrated to be so far superior that now in the next series of vehicles, all of these three different prototypes that are currently under development, that design is being included so that now we can, can allow supersonic operations over land. This is one launched in 2007, but they expect the first flights in 2023, business jet. This is the second one, about the same speed, about the same altitude, about the same range and distance. And here you have the third one. So yes, technology keeps developing. And then that's only supersonic. If you want to go hypersonic, that means at least five times the speed of, 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 uh, of sound. So that before that was only possible like with the X-15 with rocket propulsion. With your new generation of engines that are called scramjet engines, you can make it possible to have hypersonic transportation. So um, for example, this one, which was just a test vehicle, it was actually flown in 2011 to 20 times the speed of sound. And it flew for uh, nine minutes before they have problems with, it, with the system. Now, my question to you would be, unfortunately I cannot ask you in person, but is there an incentive? Is there a market for this? There is, it's a huge market for this. Because now, for example, if you want to fly from, let's say from Tokyo to London, if you fly on board the Boeing 787, that will take you 10 hours and seven minutes. If you can fly at Mach 7, it's one hour and 45 minutes. If you are close to Mach 10, it's one hour. So what that means is that you can go anywhere around the world, at least in about two hours. FedEx, DHL, cargo transports, they want that capability now. The same thing with business, Aviation, they want that capability now. So that's why there is a push to go in that direction. And uh, Dr. Wawan, how much time do I have left? Five minutes? Please. Or how am I doing? No problem. How much time? Tell me. So I can interesting. <laughs> Tell me how much, how many more minutes do I have? Yeah, Dr. Tessa. Yes, doc. Uh, no, no problem. Uh, this is in, in, in an interesting uh, topic, so take your time, doc. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> now, now let me jump into commercial space flight because we're dealing with that right now. This is one of the vehicles. It's called the Strata Launch. At this point, it's, it's been used as a test vehicle for other companies that want to test vehicles that will go to space. This one will not carry people. But that's the biggest airplane in the world. It's the equivalent of two Boeing 747s, okay? That, that's a real thing. So now let me share with you. You have seen the news, you have seen TV, some of the recent human flights on suborbital vehicles. This is the one Blue Origin with the owner of Amazon.com, Jeff Bezos, that he flew and it became the first commercial flight. One interesting issue about this one, there is no pilot on board. Blue Origin is completely automated flight using some level of artificial intelligence. So no pilot, 
or everybody on board will be just passengers. And by the way, the technical term that is being used now is not space passengers, it's space flight participants. That's, that's the actual technical term around the world. Then of course, there was the second flight with Captain Kirk or actor William Shatner from Star Trek, if you remember. But it was interesting because uh, they actually shared some of the experience and some of the physiological effects that they had in flight. But once again, it's starting. Now, Virgin Galactic suborbital flight, this is the only vehicle today that is being flown manually with pilot and co-pilot instead of full automation. So as you remember, they flew with Richard Branson, the owner of Virgin Galactic, and the rest of them were not paying passengers. They were actually employees from the company, plus the pilot and the co-pilot. So the difference is now both suborbital flights, one completely automated and a capsule, which is vertical takeoff and landing. In this case, it's a glider, so it's like an airplane. But also look at, and we also pay attention to that, the designs of the seats, completely different types of designs of seats. You have to pay attention from the point of view of crash worthiness, from the point of, the point of view of when you go in a suborbital space flight, you only have about four minutes of microgravity exposure. And what that means is that when you are coming back, you have to get back to your seat immediately because you are re-entering the atmosphere. So the issue becomes, how do you make it possible for everybody to get back to their seats when they are flat, uh, still floating, okay? Now that was suborbital. Let me jump and now cover a little bit about orbital flights. And here we have the developments. The one that has been flying is the SpaceX Dragon capsule, Lockheed Orion, which actually is being tested and they have had problems, the same thing with Boeing CST-100, but also the company Sierra Nevada continues the development of what is called the Dream Chaser, which is the equivalent of a mini, mini space shuttle, okay? So, but once again, in this operation, we have the SpaceX that has been going to the International Space Station for NASA purposes, taking astronauts, but the first total civilian flight was this one, the Inspiration4 mission. With the billionaire, Jared, that's a guy here. The geoscientist, that's sign right there. Haley Arsenault, cancer survivor. And I will tell you the implications of that. And data engineer, Chris Ambrosky. She flew actually with a prosthetic uh, knee. But now NASA and commercial space operators, there is an emphasis on allowing people with disabilities to fly in space. And we're talking about also people, not only with, for example, uh, sensory disabilities, but also with mobility disabilities, could be paraplegics, could be quadriplegics. But then the question becomes, what do you have to do about, or think about the potential implications of prosthetic devices in microgravity, but also in confined spaces and whole things, including NASA. NASA is starting studies. How can they allow para-astronauts to fly on board the uh, vehicles to the International Space Station? And in fact, European Space Agency is also going in that, in that direction. They started the, the first program, it was called the para-astronauts, okay? Now, what I like this flight is because it conducted research. And the Trish, Corp the Trish uh, Institute in uh, Houston, uh, we, uh, we, we have communications with them. So they did a lot of research where they brought biosensors, but also they did some cognitive testing looking at behavioral and cognitive performance during the flight, because this was, if you remember, it was a three-day flight for the civilians. They had sensors for all of these measurements. They even had an ultrasound device, which is called a butterfly IQ, that you can plug it to your cell phone, your smartphone, and they were doing ultrasounds in microgravity. So the idea is that we need to do more research because now since we're going to be allowing people with medical problems to fly in space, we have to learn what's happening to them. That's one of the, the questions, okay? Here they also collected uh, uh, blood because they were looking at immune function and inflammation. And that was using another miniaturized equipment that didn't exist until now. They did also balance and perception testing. And also they had to develop a medical record system to collect all of the information that, that they started and they want to continue that. 
But that's just the beginning with SpaceX. But SpaceX is another one. It is completely automated flight. There is no pilot on board. So from a human factor's point of view, you have to think about the reliability of the systems. Also, in case of any emergency in flight, what is the interaction with the occupants? Is there any malfunction that they could do something or absolutely nothing? Because now you're not talking about a suborbital flight where you go up and down in a flight profile of about two and a half hours. Now you're talking about staying there for days. So the safety implications are different. Of course, with a, space, a spaceship, a starship, well, that he wants to go to the moon, but then this is something that most, most people don't talk about it. But Bigelow has been developing an inflatable module or inflatable station. In fact, he obtained the rights to the technology developed by NASA. It was called the Transat Inflatable Space Station. Well, he has had one of his modules attached to the International Space Station now for more than two years. What that he wants is his own private space station, and he can do it actually. And with some modifications, that could become the first civilian private moon base. So uh, he's investing a lot of money. He's a, also a billionaire, but he's also getting money from NASA because he's developing some equipment for them as well. But there is another option high altitude balloon flights. And these I'm going to show you two because these are two US companies, but there are some other companies around the world. Now, instead of just going to a suborbital flight to 61 miles or 100 kilometers, you just go halfway to about 30 kilometers. But then you can be up there for about six hours and you can carry more people. Why, why 30 kilometers and is this equivalent? Well, you are not going to experience microgravity. But the number one reason around the world, based on surveys done, why people want to go in space is to see the curvature of Earth. It's not to float in microgravity, it's to see the curvature. That's why you see that both the vehicles, the suborbital and orbital space vehicles, they have plenty of windows so that the occupants will be able to take photos and look at them at Earth. But in this one, now you can do it for hours. This one for six hours and this one you will be able to do it for up to 12 hours. But the way I'm looking at these things, these are going to become also excellent floating laboratories to do research and to do research both related to physiology, but also related to human factors and other things. So that's also another option now. And the types of research in support of human commercial space flight, from our perspective, FAA is you can do research relate to operational safety. But at this point, as of today, the FAA in commercial space flight, not in the aviation part, but in commercial space, we have two, two responsibilities, safety of operations, but also the, to promote the development of the industry. So we don't have that in aviation anymore. That disappeared in the 1970s. What that means is that also we have to help these companies so that they're facilitate their business, sustain it, and grow so that this industry becomes a big industry. But then you have the other issue about modifying, decreasing the medical liability, because now people are going to be flying with medical conditions because they're not astronauts, they're spaceflight participants. And most of these people who are signing for these flights, they want to contribute to space science. In particular, they want to contribute to medical research in flight, and that's why it's happening. So, with that in mind, I will share with you because we had in the FAA, it was called the Center of Excellence in Commercial Space Transportation. And there, what we did is research in these four different areas. Aerospace access and operations is more with procedures, more with the vehicles. This was our area of involvement, human operations and space flight. And then industry innovation, which was to promote the development of the industry. So this is where we have research area three aerospace physiology and medicine, personnel training. Uh, this is um, environmental control and life support systems, habitability and human factors and human ratings. So all of that was in this, in this uh, section of research. So as a result of that, we started looking, do we have any gaps today? And I would say that those are opportunities for some of you younger scientists, younger doctors that these are the areas where we need to do more research related to commercial space, where we do not have the answers. Like for example, right now, we need to identify the effects of 
the space environment, and it's not just microgravity, but it's, for example, a sealed cabin environment where you have recirculated air, you have also issues of potentially about potential exposure to vibration in the vehicles, issues about exposure to noise, all kinds of issues. But for example, just, just thinking about the flight profile and then the exposure to microgravity. Well, are you going to allow a diabetic to fly in space? And if it is, if it is yes, well, control with what? The same thing with passengers or spaceflight participants with cardiac disease and dysrhythmias, thrombo, thrombo, thrombotic disease, obesity. I mentioned already medical disabilities and assistive technologies. So what, why the issue about medications? Because once you go in microgravity, anything that you take by mouth is not absorbed and utilized the same way as opposed to being on Earth. For example, the effectiveness of antibiotics decreases in microgravity and the pathogenicity of any microorganism increases in microgravity. And if you have a medication that has to be taken by mouth, well, you also don't absorb it as fast because in microgravity, the peristalsis of your intestines decreases because you don't have gravity. So you have to deliver via, via intramuscular, intravenous, uh, sublingual, subdermic, but you have to look at different ways to deal with this. And that has to do with the medications that I'm showing there. But if you have cardiovascular diseases, well, then you have to think about blood pressure control, particularly some of the side effects of beta blockers and alpha blockers, anticoagulants, blood glucose control, then the specific issues about the administration of the medications. Another area is, and it's a big one, because now you're talking, you're not talking about professional astronauts, you're talking about people from the general population. So one area of interest, not only to us, but also the commercial space industry, how to deal with anxiety, panic among the space flight participants. They can say, yep, I want to fly, yep, I'm going to pay my ticket, which by the way, are very expensive right now. But then once they get there, they get nervous, they get stressed out, or they may get panic or very anxious. Should we medicate them or not? Is the medication going to work or not? If they are, have the predisposition to anxiety and panic, should they be allowed to fly or not? Then you have the issues about operational performance during stress, because that has an impact on using personal protective equipment, including putting your suit on, applying harnesses, any other protection devices that you have up there, but then also emergency action, such as having to put your oxygen mask on, operate some controls, some switches, whatever it is. Is that going to be impacted just because of these aspects of anxiety, panic? And then how do you manage? Now, if it is a orbital flight, eh, you don't have to worry that long. Once again, the entire flight profile is about two and a half to three hours and only about four minutes of microgravity exposure. But now if you talk about commercial orbital flights, you are talking about hours to days to weeks. So how are we going to deal with that? Then also space motion sickness. The incidence of space motion sickness, even in the astronaut population, career astronauts, about 80 to 85% of them get motion sick in the first 24 to 32 hours of flight. So what can you expect now from people from the general population who will fly as space flight participants? So we have to learn about that. And particularly also people who may have other pathologies that may predispose them to have space motion sickness. But then you can say, well, the, the, uh, the, um, their solution here is medicate them. Give them medication against motion sickness that even though they may have side effects like drowsiness and blurred vision, so what? They're not operating the vehicle. But what about if they're taking other medications that those medications will have synergistic or antagonistic effects with anti-motion sickness medications? So then that becomes a problem. Then the medical data, that has become another big deal. At this point in time, there is no consensus on what should be the type of medical record system and database to be used by all of the companies with the same data fields so that you can start collecting medical data that will be usable and it will be accessible to everybody, of course, after de-identifying the individuals. There is no consensus today. And from a human factors point of view, we have a couple of issues. And 
Let me cover this one, circadian rhythm, disruption, and fatigue. We know about fatigue in aviation operations. We don't know about commercial space operations. For astronauts, well, they have a different schedule, professional astronauts. But now you're talking about suborbital flights where you could have crews going up and down several times a day or several times per week. Or in case of orbital flights, staying there. But like in aviation, the FAA regulates flight time limits and duty time limits. Should we regulate that, regulate that also for commercial space flight or not? And then also these issues, space vehicle crash worthiness, restraint systems, emergency evacuation systems, false mishap survival equipment, and then a big one, safety related human center automation issues related to operation of space vehicles. I mentioned to you that just today, SpaceX, uh, the uh, Dragon capsule and Blue Origin, they have fully automated space flights. So, <clears throat> there are human factors issues there as well, as far as what are backup system, do you have a human backup or do you have a computer that is a backup? And then also the human factor standards for aerospace vehicle maintenance. I mentioned that to you in the aviation side, we should probably implement also for commercial space transportation. And the effects of exposure to acceleration and microgravity on performance not on physiology, but in this case, on cognitive performance and psychomotor performance. And should we start doing alcohol and drug testing of uh, safety personnel in commercial space industry? I mean, we do it in the commercial aviation industry. Like uh, and now crew resource management, crew resource management is a requirement for all crews in commercial aviation. Well, what about for the ones that are piloted like Virgin Galactic, should they have a requirement of crew resource management or not? That should be mandated by the FAA. And actually, let's stop right there. So now let's open it up to questions. Any questions here? Comments? Let me stop sharing so we can see each other. There we go. OK. Uh, thank you, Dr. Antoniano, for your nice presentation. Before we start our q &A session, uh, let me allow me to welcoming a couple of our chief of uh, in medical medical faculty. First, there's a chief of community medicine, Dr. Asti. Then our chief of aerospace medicine program, Prof. Budi Sampurna. Uh, chief of occupational medicine magister program, Dr. Dewi Sumarko. Chief of occupational medicine study program. Dr. Nuri Purwito, Chief of Sport Medicine Study Program, Dr. Nora Sutarina, Doc, uh, Chief of Family Medicine and Primary Care Program, Dr. Danasari Vidyawati, Chief of Occupational Health and Sport Direct Directorate General of Ministry of Health. Then, nice uh, meeting you uh, and thank you for participating. I appreciate it. <laughs> Let me uh, pile the questions. Uh, I, I can see the questions here. Yes. Do you want me to start with those questions? Let me check. From the chat? Uh, yes. I uh, think the first question is from Dr. Ratno. Ratno. OK. Yeah, Dr. Ratno. Let me, let me read it here. Uh, Regarding this pandemic, where aviation is restricted, which aspect of human factors must be considered related to the possibility of decreasing pilot abilities since they don't fly in long period? That's a very good question. And in fact, that, that, came, that uh, came to us saying, look, if you have had so many pilots that were flying every single day or they were flying constantly and now they have been for weeks, months or longer not flying, how do you return them to the cockpit and you do it safely? Well, one thing that we emphasized was that even if they could not fly the rear airplane, to try to fly flight simulators, okay? And that was done in certain companies where they had access to them. So that was one way of trying to retain your skills and your ability. But there is no question that we don't know what has been the level, level of deterioration of skills and abilities as a result of not flying. Now, my, all the questions that we had, after one week of not flying versus one month versus several months, is there a difference in reacquiring the skills by retraining. And we don't have the answer to that. 
Now, fortunately, we have been very careful. And the people who have been, the pilots who have been flying before they go back to the airplane, they, go, they do the validation um, in uh, flight simulators. So that before they return to the cockpit, they have experience in pot any, potential medical, uh, any potential emergency. So that is helping right there, but we don't have all of the answers. Okay, the next one. Next one from Dr. Andrew. Uh, he asked about pro training. When do you, when do we do pro training and hypobaric chamber training, and who is the target of the pro training? Oh, that's a good question. Well, for years we used to have only the altitude chambers and the hypobaric chambers. And as you know, the way that we simulate going to altitude is we you actually create vacuum inside the chamber, or we decrease the pressure by sucking the air out of the chamber, and that's how we simulate going to altitude. And that way you can simulate, for example, the effects on the human body of gas expansion in your lungs, your intestines, your middle ears, and if, unfortunately your sinuses as well. That's how you do it. Well, the limitation of a hypobaric chamber is that you have to go where the chamber is because it's not mobile. So we went in the direction of the prod, but also it's called the ROBE. In the military, they, they, they call it, excuse me, the ROBD, the reuse oxygen breathing device. Mm -hmm. So the way that the military has been doing it in stealth our case, where we have a portable chamber, flexible chamber, mixing nitrogen with oxygen, we don't use compressed gas. For that chamber, what we use is the oxygen concentrators. Mm -hmm. It's the same kind of oxygen concentrators that you have in hospitals or for patients with COPD with the portable units. So essentially what you are doing is just is manipulating the, the quantity of nitrogen mm -hmm. versus oxygen. The ROBD using the military, you have to use pressurized gas and they use pressurized uh, nitrogen and oxygen. So that has limitations because you have to carry the equipment. You have to carry the tanks and once you're not out of gas, now you cannot do it. We can continue doing it. Now, in what cases? If we want the initial exposure, we want them to learn the physiological effects of the pressure change plus the hypoxia. And you can only get that in a hyperbaric chamber. Now, once you got the first experience where you learn what happens to your ear, your intestines, your lungs, uh, what are the physiological change, the environmental changes like drop in temperature, solid gas expansion, condensation of water vapor in the chamber, when you did it the first time. Now for subsequent, if you are all interested in them remembering the effects of hypoxia, then you do it with the prot, where you don't change the barometric pressure. So the only thing that you simulate is hypoxia. So that's the difference between those two. Okay, let me see the next one. Thank you for that. Uh, okay. Yeah, Very few human factors. What concern consideration should we have related to pilot performance to operate the enhancement of, oh, MCAS software? Maybe operator can, uh... Yes, so that's, the, the that's question. not for me on the medical side. Yeah. However, that has a human factor component that obviously on any system, it doesn't matter if it is MCAS or whatever it is, then okay. you have to make sure that number one, there is plenty of training so that you know how to use it. You have to learn the failure modes. You have to learn how to identify an early failure. And then you have to identify manual modes of operating to take control over the aircraft, okay? So yes, there are significant issues about training. Yes, there were mistakes done with the design of the software that now those have been corrected in some of that. So there are other areas that are outside my expertise because I'm not an aerospace engineer. <laughs> okay, no. And meanwhile, we have Dr. Daniel who would like to ask you a question directly. Okay. Uh, okay. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Daniel. Hello, Dr. Daniel. Hello, Dr. Antonano. How are you? Oh, doing fine. Thank you. Yes, uh, actually, I'm just uh, writing at the Q&A box, but thank you very much for allowing me to speak directly to you. So uh, we last met at the Debrecen Hungary in 2019. So I'm very having a very simple question to you. 
my point is, uh, from my point of view as a aviation medicine specialist who practice at the private public hospital. So what is your advice and suggestion for us who practice in the private public hospital? Because in here, in Indonesia, this, this field, aviation medicine is very rare and very new and very unusual for public in here. So uh, for me, in my point of view, I'm very, very uh, have a high effort to introduce and to have a, a introduction to all my patients. Thank you, doctor. Well, there, there are some areas for, I would say, physicians in private practice who want to maintain involvement related to aviation medicine. There is one, obviously, that if you have designated aviation medical examiners, I don't know if you have them in Indonesia or not, that's one way of maintaining your involvement with aviation medicine and to do physical exams for pilots. Another area would be, I don't know if you do phys physical exams also for air traffic controllers, where you also apply some of your knowledge related to, to uh, performance aspects in aerospace and the whole thing also with air traffic. Now, another area is uh, air medical evacuation and air ambulance operations. There are many countries where physicians who have the background can act as consultants or can be, for example, the ones who can give a clearance on whether or not certain patient with certain medical condition should or should not fly. Now, obviously, if you have an air ambulance operation, they may already have their medical uh, personnel. But if you have airlines, that's where you have sometimes the option, because I will tell you, there are still many people flying as passengers around the world who should, should not be flying because of their medical condition. And unfortunately, nobody does a ground medical assessment before flight on whether or not they should be flying. So I see that as a problem all over the world where we have failed to make them understand that for certain pathologies, there should be a medical evaluation to determine whether or not they should be able to fly as patients or as passengers with medical problems. So I could say that's another thing where for example, I know of a couple of hospitals and clinics in the US that they actually are consultants for even um, uh, aviation passenger societies or groups or advocacy groups to say, look, we can give you advice if you have medical issues on whether or not you should fly. And that's how they are doing business, okay? <laughs> another, another area is of course with the military. Yep, they have aeromedical evacuation. You can be a flight surgeon with the military. In the US, you can be on the reserves. I don't know if that's available or not in Indonesia, where you are in civil practice, but then you have your weekends that you are with the military performing aviation medicine. So those are some of the options that I would consider for you that I think would be available to you if you have an entrepreneur spirit to start approaching all of these groups saying, look, I can give you consultation whether or not you should fly. And you know, that's another issue because sometimes for, for general physicians, telling their patients, hey, you, can, you can fly. I don't see why you shouldn't. And when you have a bad outcome and something happens to that patient, then the issue becomes what's the legal liability of that doctor having cleared the passenger or the patient to say, yes, you can fly, but the flight killed the patient or caused a medical complication. That's another issue. So that connects it then to medical insurance companies. <laughs> but sometimes it is the medical insurance companies that can say, look, we would like to have to know for certain people if they should or should not fly because we don't want to pay if something goes bad. <laughs> or for malpractice insurance for physicians, the same thing. <laughs> so I just gave you a couple of ideas. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Very clear. Well, Thank you. Thank you, so, uh, for the questions. So operator, can you please uh, share again the questions? Well, I can see it. I'm scrolling down. So the next one was uh, from Oh, okay. Dr. Addis. Are there any tools? Uh, oh. Okay, oh, Addis. Yes, in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic. Of board, are there any? Yeah, the HIPAA filters, yes, that's a good idea. The other one, we have been looking at ventilation rates. Because as you know, right now, in a typical commercial flight at cruise altitude, you have 49% recirculation of cabin air and 51% is fresh air coming from the outside. So the reason to do that is not only, uh, well, 
it has implications from a point of view of pressurization, but also that fuel consumption. But we have determined that the 40, 49% recirculation of cabin air, that's sufficient under normal conditions. So there were some suggestions that during an infectious disease, why don't you increase the amount of fresh air and decrease the amount of recirculated air on board an aircraft? What's the problem with that? That increases fuel consumption. That also may result on additional issues related to, particularly in the older aircraft, with the control of relative humidity on board the cabin and, and some, some other issues. Another thing that you can do, and that's exactly, I, in fact, that's what I'm doing. Right now, when I fly, I don't use a seat next to the aisle. I try to use the seat away from the aisle, the one next to the window. And then on the Jasper valve that you have above you to control how much ventilation you get, you put it, open it, and make it point to your face. So that it's constantly flowing air against your face. Now, is it possible that we may change? You remember that at the beginning of the pandemic, they were separating passengers and only uh, every other aisle of seat you had passengers, mm -hmm. but you didn't have every single aisle. Mm -hmm. Well, you cannot continue that, that, that yeah. kind of operation. It's not, it's not good business to do that. But yes. at the same time, we are learning more about what are the patterns of distribution of particles on board an aircraft. And sometimes the, tip, the, the uh, critical area is who is the source of the infection and how the, the circulation patterns of the air will distribute the particles. So there are still many, many technologies that have been explored and we'll learn more. So if you want to scroll to the next one. Uh, next question, please operator. From Gabriel Farah. Are there any tools or assessments yes. at all to make sure pilots are mentally ready to begin their flight duty? Well, here, not before every, every flight, no. And that uh, has been tried many times in the past. It's called uh, readiness to perform testing. And readiness for, to perform testing, well, that can you do, for example, a cognitive test that tells you if uh, you are sharp, if your reaction time, if your anal analytical capabilities, if your memory capabilities are very good, so that you should be flying. Well, we have some of those tools. We have some of those tests, but to apply them before every flight, that would be a logistical nightmare today. It would be very difficult to do that. What, you know, what sometimes becomes even better than that is, it never fails that somebody may report could be a passenger, could be another crew member, could be a flight attendant saying, hmm, I'm reporting to the FA that I saw something suspicious or something that was wrong with this person. And sometimes when we, most of the times when we have such a report, we follow it and there is a problem with that person, <laughs> okay? So that's reasonable suspicion. It's like, for example, alcohol testing. It's very rare to find a positive test for alcohol in a pilot, very rare. The ones that we find are on the reasonable suspicion. What does that mean? That somebody reported that to us. <laughs> and that's when you catch them because then you do the test and you determine that they're already addicted to it because they can, they can, a random check, you may not have a random check for years. And that doesn't mean that you're not using the alcohol or you're not using the drugs. So reasonable suspicion is where we get most positives. With all of these technologies in place now for the flight crew, is there a better trained technology for the flight crew to increase resiliency during an unexpected event? Yes. That's a very good question. And I would say yes in general, but there are still some challenges. When we introduce cockpit automation, if you remember that was back in the mid 1980s, and that's when flight navigators and flight engineers essentially were eliminated. So instead of flying with four, you started flying with two, only with pilot and co-pilot. Mm -hmm. And that was because of the oil crisis and it was to decrease consumption, to increase also efficiency of the aircraft. And let's face it, to have two less people to pay. <laughs> but here's the thing, suddenly now you rely on automated systems. Can you say that all automated systems are perfect? Nope. 
they were designed by humans. And we humans make mistakes. So therefore in the programming of systems, there are mistakes built in. So what do we have to do? Make sure that still the people in the cockpit are monitoring what the systems are doing. So that's part of the resiliency, which is human resiliency that don't rely completely on the automation to the point where you don't know what the system is doing. You should be fully aware of what the computers are doing, no matter what is the face of the flight. Now, are we going to improve resiliency in unexpected events in the near future with our systems? I think we are. With artificial intelligence and machine learning, I think that we're going to have better systems that will be able to identify certain things that are going wrong in the operation of an aircraft that, that are before, let's say, sensory detection by the pilot or even cognitive detention, detection by the pilot. But because of monitoring with artificial intelligence, you may be able to identify something that is starting to go wrong before it goes wrong. So essentially, you start identifying those precursors to malfunctions. I think we're going to see some of that there. We will. Next question. Next question. This is from my... pilot, one of the most yeah. is drowsiness. Yes, especially in long haul. Yes, <laughs> sometimes we can measure how far the flight is drowsiness. Microsoft, yes. Yeah. Is there an available yeah. concept yeah. prototype of yeah. drowsiness? Yes, there are several systems that you can do that, but I will tell you. And that's, I don't know if you're familiar with the studies done by NASA. They had the Na NASA fatigue countermeasures program. And in fact, you can still go and just browse it that way, NASA fatigue countermeasures program. And they, they actually did studies on long flights, short flights, north, south, east, west, west, east, to identify patterns of fatigue among different pilots in different operations. And if you go on long flights, let's say at least eight hour flights, you will have some level of fatigue, you will. So there were some recommendations that particularly once you go beyond eight hours, that, or if you had a previous flight that you may not have recovered from that flight when you had your sleep period, that there is a place for what is called strategic napping. And what that means is that in flight, you're, you're in a, let's say a routine phase the flight on, let's say level flight at high altitude where you're not going to change anything probably for some time, take a nap between 10 to 15 minutes that will help recover from sleep inertia and also from level of fatigue. That was the recommendation. And in fact, in the tests, it worked very well, but because of, I will tell you, because of politics, we never implemented that in the United States. But I know of other countries that in their own countries, they use that information, that data from NASA, and they actually allow pilots in long flights to take nap as long as it is not at the same time. They take turns and do not exceed 15 minutes. Because if you exceed a nap of 15 minutes, you go into deep sleep. And it will take you longer to recover from being sleeping as opposed to the benefits of the, of the micro nap. So now as far as measuring it, yes, there are new devices. In fact, the new Apple phone, excuse me, Apple watch mm. and several other smart watches, they have some of the same sensors that we use in research called the actigraphy monitors. And that's why you have now like some of these uh, wearables that they will tell you the quality of your sleep. They will tell you about your exercise. That's because of actigraphy, which is based on accelerometers. And that has an indirect indication of fatigue, but it is not quantifiable. That's part of the problem. That I cannot tell you, well, yep, you are lightly fatigued, you are moderately fatigued, or you are very fatigued. You cannot quantify it today. We're going to reach that point with gene expression research, because we're also we're doing some of that research at the Institute. Can we identify that a person is tired based on gene expression and even post-mortem? Can we uh, identify based on remains of pilots if you were tired before you die? Because that changed the RNA when you were still alive. Yeah. So we already identified about 40 genes that change as a result of that. 
So we're going to get to that point. At this point, what my, my recommendation to you, always before any long flight, try to sleep a minimum of eight hours in the previous 24 hours so that you are well rested, well rested before you go fly. Now, if your company policies allow that, coordinate with your pilot and co-pilot, and if you can take a strategic or a short nap, do it. Do not try to stay awake by drinking coffee, large amounts of coffee and caffeine. The problem with coffee is that you reach the, the amount of coffee that then is going to cause uh, problems with uh, concentration. And also it starts creating some nervousness and it's like anxiety if you are not used to that level of, of caffeine. So that's not a good idea to try to control it. And um, by the way, when you have the intermediate destination, let's say that you have a long flight, now you stay at the target side for let's say 24 hours or longer before you are allowed to fly back because of the flight time and duty time limits. One problem that is common is that some crews, particularly young pilots, instead of sleeping, they go and enjoy the nightlife <laughs> locally and they don't take enough time to sleep and they don't recover before the next flight. So all of that is called sleep hygiene. If you're interested, send me an email. And Dr. Wawan has my email or you can share my email and I can send you some additional tips and some additional information. Uh, next one. Uh, doctor, you said, oh, uh, okay. eight, uh, you said eight hours in the last 24 hours. Is it uh, still possible to divide the eight hours? Like six hours and two hours of sleep or maybe no, that, that's, a, that's or... a problem that mm -hmm. if you fragment your sleep and you say, let's say, well, yep, I slept eight hours in 24, mm -hmm. but it was not together. Continuously. So I slept six mm -hmm. hours, then I was awake and then I slept two other hours. It's mm -hmm. not the same oh, okay. because deep sleep is where you recover. Mm -hmm. And if you affect deep sleep by waking up too early, now the benefit of that is not the same. That's part of the problem. It's called fragmented sleep periods. That, that doesn't help. That's why, for example, for many of us with age, that you wake in the middle of the night, and if you have a large prostate, you have to go more often because you have to go to the bathroom to pee. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that could cause some fragmented sleep as well, which means then you have uh, fatigue. Oh, I see. Not that, not that. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, next question is from Enda, Dr. Enda Viranti. How to handle the rules, the rules of the pilot, pilot for air crew experience on the plane? Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting question. I, I guess that what that means is if you identify the symptoms that may be suspicious of COVID-19 or if you have some symptoms and you actually carry the test with you and the test is positive. There are two different issues there because you could have some symptoms that could be just an upper respiratory infection and it's not actually COVID-19. But if you test yourself and you're in flight, what can you do? <laughs> I would say just, if you're the pilot, just continue flying, land the aircraft and now go home or go to seek medical care. I don't think there will be any other thing that you can do. Now, mm -hmm. the other thing you could do and you should do is make sure that you put your, your uh, face mask on, particularly if you're flying in the cockpit with the co-pilot or if the co-pilot is the infected one, the pilot should be wearing the, the mask. I know that there are concerns among pilots that, well, I don't want to wear that mask because then that interferes with my respiration. And then what about if we have an emergency and then I put the, have to put the emergency oxygen mask on? Actually, you know, in practice, you can do it. But another thing is you have to use the right mask. Now, particularly with the, uh, with the chrome, uh, unless a cloth mask, unless it has three layers and even better, four layers, is not very effective. Or if you have an N94, N95 mask. Those are the ones, and you can buy them now. You, they are accessible. So that's the, that's what I would suggest that you do. <laughs> Other than that, somebody has to land that airplane. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <Somebody has to. laughs> for the management of fatigue in pilots, are there any new developments for the science of the resting cabin? Oh yes, that's a big deal. 
for some aircraft, you have the proper resting facility. In fact, you have some beds, like the Boeing 777, the Airbus 340, the Boeing trip, the, uh, uh, let me see, the 767, and several other aircraft. You actually have crew rest facilities where you have beds, where you can control the light, where you, you are actually in an area with no noise. So that depends on the aircraft, I would say. Yes, the designs work, but you have to pay attention because for example, I had the chance to test or to check the one on the Boeing 787, which has a very nice resting facility. But then I noticed that in the control panel where you control, uh, because you can uh, listen to music, you can control the light, you can control the ventilation, uh, I noticed that there were folded magazines covering the panel. And I asked, well, why is that happening? Well, in the design of the panel where you control everything there, they put a very bright LED white light that if you don't cover it, then doesn't let you sleep because it's too bright. So that was a poor, poor consideration in the human factors to put an LED to show you where the panel is when in fact the problem is the LED. It's too bright. Mm. <laughs> That's why they cover it with, with folded magazines. So yes, that not all aircraft have that. And the solution, in my opinion, is not reserve a couple of seats in business class for the pilots, because you don't completely isolate yourself mm. from the rest of the passengers. Passengers continue making noise. They walk. They, there are still distractions. But I mean, once again, depends upon the aircraft, unfortunately. Yeah. Next one. One from Dr. Manda. Feature concept of CDI. CDI. In the previous statement, with that said, the pilot with a weekly mention with a feature of aviation or more related with system. That's a very, very, very good question. But I would say it depends because with more technology, for example, I started seeing the application of the brain computer interface <coughs> for patients who are on wheelchairs. And they're controlling the wheelchair with one of these interfaces or controlling mm -hmm. legs or controlling uh, hands. So, and in fact, um, everything depends upon the redundancy of the systems. So if you have the redundancy to identify, for example, mistakes or errors, and then that allows another way of controlling, then that's, that's an approach, even if, if uh, as humans, we're a weak link. But let me give you an example that I use that I would like to see that technology in the future where it could actually save people. In general aviation in the United States, every year we have cases where the pilot in general aviation is flying with a passenger. Something happens to the pilot in flight and now the passenger doesn't know how to fly an aircraft. If you have a brain computer interface, you could actually put it on that passenger and essentially transmit the information, transmit the commands to actually be able to land that aircraft. And there is research going on right now in the University of Washington where you can actually have two computer, computer interfaces, and one transmitting commands to the other person via the interface, and the second person does it, not knowing why he or she did it. <laughs> so we're talking about the beginning of this technology, but there is a lot of money going into this, a lot of money going into this. And believe it or not, another incentive for this is, is uh, games. Brain control games, there is a huge market for them. But instead of having to operate games with your fingers or with voice or whatever else, you, you reach the point of controlling a game with a, through your brain, I already know a couple of uh, those programs. So technology is getting in that direction. But yes, we have to pay attention to the human limitations. No question about it. Next one. Okay. Next question is from, from Dr. Amelia during this pandemic era. Do you still do research about fatigue, burnout, or stress in pilots? And are there any interesting risk factors that can contribute to these conditions since the flight hours is decreasing nowadays? Thank you, Dr. Antonio. That's an interesting question. Well, um, 
I would say in the last year and a half, we haven't done any research because of the issues of availability or pilots because they haven't been flying. But also we have to make sure that there is a difference between fatigue related to the operation versus fatigue that may be connected to having been infected to COVID, with COVID-19 that produces chronic fatigue. So how do we establish a difference between those two? And right now, we don't know how. In fact, I asked that question uh, to some of our researchers that um, if one of, you have some of the most common effects, the sequela of COVID-19 are cognitive in nature. One is what they're calling brain fog, where you, you don't think right. Thinking, making decisions, analyzing information. That's why it's called brain fog. But the second one is fatigue, routine fatigue. So how, as part, let's say, of a physical exam, should we look with some kind of test to identify some of those potential sequela? And if so, what do we use? We are looking at that right now. We don't know yet, okay? Next one. one. This is from Captain Wasi from Indonesian Pilot Association. First question is, are there any new mandates regarding en en enhanced accident protection or survival equipment such as airbags or others? And when are they required for new and old aircraft? That's a very good question. I will tell you, at this point, we didn't make it mandatory. But the, what is happening is that now, aviation companies or airline companies, and also in general aviation, they are already installing, for example, some of the, the um, seat belts with built-in airbags. Mm -hmm. I flew uh, about two years, two and a half years ago in a Japan Airlines Boeing 777. Every single passenger seat mm -hmm. had one of those seat belts with an airbag. So we're not making it mandatory because what we're seeing is that the industry on their own, they're implementing those systems. And in general aviation is also happening that people who can afford to buy a general aviation aircraft, they can certainly afford to, uh, to have one of those uh, airbag systems. And our airbags that deploy weather from the, from the seat belt, but now we also have some other systems where the airbags deploy, for example, for passengers from the bulkhead so that they don't hit the bulkhead mm -hmm. if they are sitting next to the bulkhead, or for the ones in commercially in a, in a corporate aviation where they are mm -hmm. flying sideways like in sofas, now if they crash is sideways and they can break their neck. Well, in that case, they have seat belts where the airbag is is built in the is built into the area around the neck, so it inflates there and they don't yeah. do like this with their heads. So they are not being mandated, but they are see, we are seeing more and more. Okay. Uh, if it was up to me, I would say yes, but it would be very difficult to solely make it mandatory because then you have to ground and install and make some modifications. So we're seeing in future aircraft more and more of this. Uh, in light of the COVID situation, many passengers um, have been used for carrying cargo without such. modifications except remote transit. And you might know regarding the regarding the use practice when such an aircraft in elimination configuration. And by far five six with evacuation officers. Oh, I was still reading the previous one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, any relief from blocking? Oh, okay. Let me, let me read it again. Uh, in light of the COVID situation, many passenger aircraft have been used for carrying cargo only such as the B737-500 without modifications except removal of cabin seats. Can you enlighten us regarding the legal operations, the legal operational requirements and the US practice when such an aircraft in above mentioned configuration carrying duty bound cockpit crew and two flight attendants as standby firefighting safety evacuation officers have any relief from blocking of a wing exit, which are often used as emergency exits during ditching? Well, obviously, if you are removing seats, and I don't know if it is in the entire aircraft or use one section of the aircraft and use half for cargo and half for passengers. So, and I have seen some of those where 
you combine cargo and you combine com with passengers. And there, of course, there is still a role for the flight attendants mm -hmm. to be there to facilitate the emergency evacuation and far fighting if necessary. Now, if it is purely, if it's purely cargo, a cargo uh, operation, um, well, then I don't think if it is a purely cargo operation, that there is a need to have flight attendants on board to facilitate evacuation if there are no seats and there are no passengers. So, you know what, uh, on this one, just please, uh, Mr. Washi, if you can, um, you can get my email and let's talk about this one, okay? Send me an email and we can get in touch and I would like to explore this with you. Okay. Let's go to the next question. Will do, sir. <clears throat> Okay, next question from Dr. Mario Bitsar. There are also the increase of sport flying, such as skydiving, uh, general aviation, uh, paragliding, etc. With increasing extremities such as high altitude jumps, cross-country log flights, and more commercialized activity like tandem jumps. Is there any certain update in medical requirement or regulation regarding such activities? I to tell you, there is no standardization internationally. In the US, we do not have FAA medical certification requirements for skydiving, paragliding, ultra gliding, gliders. We don't have them. Even, even for flight attendants, we don't have medical certification requirements for flight attendants in the US. Mm -hmm. Other countries, they do for all of them, for all of them. So at this point, there is no change in the US. In other countries, Yes, like for example, well, there is, was a change for us. About uh, seven, eight years ago, we had to implement what is called the basic med pilot. That if you are flying certain type of aircraft up to six seats, but you don't fly into controller space and other restrictions based on the power of the aircraft, you can fly without a valid FAA medical certificate as long as you have a valid pilot a driver's license. We, uh, we, uh, yeah, like that, but it happened. And there are about 30,000 pilots like those flying today in the United States. Certain category of operations with no medical certificate. Canada has similar situation and also Australia and Wait. also in some countries in the U.S. What? Jadi kemarin yang sudah dibeli. Okay. Thank you. Next questions. This is from Captain Tree. Do we need a psychological of flight crew during medical certification or check every two years, especially for single pilot operation and their operation in mountainous? When an accident happened after taking a lunch, he flown alone, broke cargo around 9,000 feet on pressurized airplane, and he forgot to descend and hit the mountain. He has habit to sleep after it. Uh, <laughs> That is a very interesting question. And what I can tell you is that we in the FAA, we don't have a specific psychological evaluation like some other countries of pilots. We do it as part of the requirements for the overall physical exam, where you look at behavior, you look at responses to questions, you look at how the person behaves, moves, um, interacts with you, communicates with you. And that gives us, that gives our aviation medical examiners an indication of psychological status. And if there is something that causes a concern, then that's when you refer to the FAA and where we can require psychological testing. Right. But yes, you have an issue here. And in fact, when you remember the, the German wings accident, well, there was, there was a different issue, but it was also psychological. And that, uh, that led to uh, some proposals that we should have a more thorough psychological evaluation for all kinds of different reasons to determine whether or not that person flagged. We didn't change ours. We didn't change ours. And so far, we haven't had a need to change ours. Now, what you mentioned here about taking lunch and then having the tendency to sleep after that, that's true. That's called postprandial post life. The period, and particularly if it is 9,000 feet on pressurized airplane and he forgot to descend and hit the, and hit the mountain. 
that that keeps happening. And here is another, this happens to us particularly in general aviation, where the assumption is you don't need supplemental oxygen unless yeah. you're flying above 10,000 feet. Yes. Well, if you are completely healthy, that regulation was based on research done on healthy individuals many years ago. But if you already have any pathology that decreases your oxygenation, then you may need oxygen below 10,000 feet. In fact, we have some people that may need oxygen as low as five, four or 5,000 feet, depending upon what pathology they have. So that, that is an issue that people have the, as they, they have the tendency to say, well, if the regulation says 10,000, no, no. it's based on, on the general, the general uh, sample of the population, but not based on healthy individuals. And that happens even more with passengers. That, that's why it was such a good change to go from the cabin pressure of 8,000 feet in the previous generation of aircraft to now maintaining 5,000 feet in the newer generation of aircraft. Because for those people who were having more medical issues and they were flying as passengers, they have less medical issues flying in those aircraft because it's a lower cabin pressure. That's where it is making also a difference right there. And okay, let's go to the next one. Next question, uh, is the FAA addressing or studying any cost and effect issues by human labor with a benefit cuts or suppressive treatment by management on pilots on anxiety, depression, or lack of uh, focus in flying by pilots to address basic financial needs? Well, what I can tell you is that we at the FAA Civil Aerospace Medical Institute, we haven't done any of these research at all. We haven't. That's a short answer to that. We yeah. have not. <laughs> okay, this is regarding uh, pandemic. <laughs> okay, uh, next questions. This is for, from Dr. Ayi Pramesti. Based on the development of aviation technology, which will have an impact on aerospace medicine, because aerospace medicine is closely related to it. Are biomedical technology and aerospace medicine related? And how big is the role? You actually of came into an area that is one of my favorite areas. And that if you want at some point, I can give you a, another one hour lecture on the aerospace medicine implications of advanced medical technologies. And on that presentation, I talk about everything from new biomedical devices to biosensors to implanted medical devices to uh, nanomedicine to stem cells, to microbiome, to uh, genomics, to gene therapy, stem cell therapy. I can, I can talk for an entire hour about how things are changing as a result of exponential developments in medical technologies, including also medical robotics. Okay. So, Thank you, Dr. I, I can give you have yeah. one hour. Great. Let's, let's schedule that in the, in the future. <laughs> Great, great. Thank you. And then next question from Dr. Fajar. UFV operation becomes common oh, today. Is there uh, any special point, medical requirements so for UFV pilots or does it That, that has become a, a, an interesting issue right now because at the beginning of civilian UAV operations in the US, we had a requirement for a class two FAA medical okay. certificate. Well, suddenly that requirement was eliminated because of pressure that they said, well, if I have a micro UAS, why should I have to pass a physical uh. exam? So that requirement was eliminated. But now the issue is this one, that we have UASs that go from micro UASs that are the size of a small bird, all the way to UASs that are the size of a Boeing 737 wingspan. That's called the ITAN, and we're operating them in the US and in other countries. So now the question becomes, there is a difference between a small versus a big one. There is a difference between a fully automated UAV versus a manually operated UAV versus a partially manual, partial automated. So depending upon that, if it is a fully automated UAV, there is no pilot. If it is a totally manual UAV, yep, there is a pilot who is on the ground. But you could, could have another situation where the pilot is on the ground operating a manual UAS, 
for the pilot for the UAS is flying on board another airplane and from that airplane is flying the UAS or the UAV. Well, now that pilot is exposed to the flight environment in the same way as the pilot who is flying the main airplane. So there are all kinds of permutations that we are looking at that right now. We are going to reassess the pain upon of type of operation, type of UAV, type of control, what should be the requirements, not only medical requirements, but also human performance requirements, licensing requirements, training requirements, name it, all of them. Security, <laughs> there are so many issues, so many issues. We have in the US right now 1.7 million civilian UAS is flying of all different sizes and categories. So anyway, next, well, I guess, uh, oh, we reach the end for countries who do not have space program like in Indonesia. How we as aerospace management specialists oh, yes, contribute, contribute to space, space development research? Yeah. Well, actually, through the International Academy of Astronautics, IAA, there is a school, a student organization within that one that actually they are creating uh, cooperative programs where you can allow people from non space nations to participate in space projects. So that's a IAA, International Academy of Astronautics. Uh, another, another way would be that, for example, even if you don't have your program in Indonesia, I'm sure that you have very rich people in Indonesia. And I would not be surprised if you have some of them who will want to fly with a space flight participants with one of the operations here in the US or elsewhere in the world but they may be coming from Indonesia. So that may be the, the beginning of something that becomes a market for certain people with certain uh, income, but you can start providing some guidance locally. Like for example, right now with Virgin Galactic, uh, they, they, they uh, wanted access to our aviation medical examiner directory, which includes people from around the world, doctors around the world. So that if they had space flight participants who wanted to fly in Virgin Galactic, and we had aviation medical examiners in some of the countries where those people come from, that they, they could provide additional training in space medicine to those aviation medical examiners so that the me medical screening could be done initially in their own country using our existing aviation medical examiner population. So that's another way that is also expanding as well. Okay, maybe for uh, last questions. Uh, how are we doing? Probably uh, that's close to the end, isn't it? Yeah, uh, last question, doctor. About uh, flying, flying without oxygen of approximately 10 to 13,000 feet without oxygen and about the flexibility. Can you show me the question again? Can you show it to uh, me? Or maybe Dr. Herman can ask directly to Dr. Antoniano. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Herman. Please, yeah. Doc. Yeah. Uh, bisa kedengar? Bisa. I asked ask you about the Annex 6. They are say the pilot with the unpressed cabin can fly from 10,000 to 13,000 feet without a uh, oxygen equipment. What about your opinion in Annex 6? Oh, yes. In the one that it says that if you are in a non-pressurized aircraft general aviation, you can fly at up to 14,500, I think, yeah. without supplemental oxygen, but Less for than no 30 more than 30 minutes. Yeah, this is your opinion, because many accidents uh, in our country, in yeah. Papua. You know, personally, I would tell you in this case, not the, uh, the regulation, but I will tell, tell you my personal opinion. Um, if we have people with problems flying above 10,000 feet or at 10,000 feet without supplemental oxygen, now you fly any altitude higher than that. I would say, well, why take the chance of flying without supplemental oxygen? Now, in some cases, the reason for that had to do with mountains, elevation of mountains, for example, in the United States that if you were going to cross the Rocky Mountains or other high mountain areas in a small aircraft unpressurized, 
you wanted to provide the option to that pilot to be able to cross the mountains fast without having pressurization or no need for supplemental oxygen. Just today with the, the types of oxygen systems that are available with the oxygen candles and all of that, and even the mini obox that you use, even if you're not pressurized, what I recommend, well, just get one of those and at least fly with supplemental oxygen, even if it is not pressurized. So, but I agree with you, that's, I, I don't like it. I'm a pilot as well. And if I, fl if I fly about 10,000 feet, it doesn't matter. I want supplemental oxygen, even though the regulation would allow up to 30 minutes at 14.5 without it. it. I don't like that. <laughs> Thank you. And the one question, uh, another question maybe about the flexibility authority that are uh, allowed by ICAO, uh, annex uh, award, uh, ICAO document 8984 to our medical aviation specialist, they are say flexibility, special authority. Are you ex have uh, experience about that? Uh, you know, on that one, I will have to get back to you. I need to read what is the specific language in that annex. Because it's I cannot recall it right the, now. Uh, yeah. It is rather different with the wafer. That is our special condition. Yes. Well, I mean, we, we all give waivers. But we have to have a criteria to give the waivers. So is the question whether or not an aviation medical examiner has the authority to give a waiver in the United yeah. States? Yes. Uh, for static conditions where the, the medical problem will not change, like for example, if you uh, lose one eye and then you become a monocular pilot, well, that's it. For the rest of your life, you will have one eye, but that doesn't mean that the other one will go away. So yes, we can issue on their statement of demonstrated ability, a permanent. Uh, for pilots who have hypertension, we are allowing our aviation medical examiners to make the decision all of the conditions that AMEs can issue, we are delegating that responsibility to our aviation medical examiners. So in the US, for a number of conditions, we give authority to our AMEs to make the final decision. If it is other pathologies, then our decision is the final, not the legal instrument examiners. I mean, not the aviation medical exam. Does that answer the question? Yeah, 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 thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you okay. very much. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Antonio. Okay, so I think, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you know, I have made uh, copies of all of the questions that you have right yes. here. So what we can do is I can look at the ones that I didn't. Oh, I think we almost got to all of them. Well, yes. not all of them. But uh, the ones that I didn't answer, I can send a, an email with some of the answers and then you mm -hmm. just share. Okay. Thank you. And the other thing that I can do is if you want later, not now, but I can mm -hmm. share a PDF version of my presentation so that you can share with everybody who attended. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. And thank you, Dr. Antoniano. I think I have to close this interesting session because of the time constraints. And I also want to like to introduce the Dean of the University of Pertahanan, Dr. Herkutanto. And also uh, would like to summarize a bit, if you don't mind, from today's discussion. As uh, you all know, KEMI is renewing their facility of research to ensure safety on today's aviation. And we, we can also collaborate in the near future for uh, ensuring the safety. And we have to modify the regulations to accommodate new flying machine or technologies. Mm -hmm. We have to think of medical certification. And but the relaxation of single pilot commercial operation the question is how is the human factors for this? And with this more automation for the flight, uh, we have to research on these topics. And we need more research on people with prosthetic when we send them uh, to space flight participants and research on uh, physiology and human factors in space flight safety operations. And also we need to improve the effects of the space environment and we, and studies into anxiety, panic, and operational performance under stress, and response to space motion sickness. 
And also we still, there's no consensus today on medical database. And we have to insert operational safety and performance of flight crew. And there's still a uh, lot of, there's still questions that cannot be answered because of the time constraints. And we will uh, summarize the, pile up the, pull up the questions and send it to you. So maybe you can uh, uh, answer them and we will share to the participants. Okay, so again, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Antuniano. And I would also like to thank all the attendees for joining today and for the organizing committee from the residency program of in aerospace medicines, Faculty of Medicine, University of Indonesia, and also supported by Indonesian Aerospace Medical Doctor Associations. That's all from me. Uh, wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera bagi kita semuanya. Uh, good day to you all. Stay safe, healthy, and happy. Back to you, MC, Dr. Adis. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, you, Dr. Tessa. Dr. Antuniano, okay. thank you very much um, for the insightful presentation and discussion we had this morning. Um, hopefully, the updates and information we have received today will further increase the contribution of knowledge from the Aerospace Medicine Committee in Indonesia. Ladies and gentlemen, this guest lecture has now come to an end. Once again, on behalf of Indonesian Aerospace Medical Doctors Association and Aerospace Medicine Program University of Indonesia, we would like to say thank you to Dr. Antuniano as our speaker for today's lecture, the staff of Community Medicine Department, University of Indonesia, honorable guests from the Indonesian Ministry of Health, Indonesian Ministry of Transportation, NTSB, airline companies, pilot associations, fellow colleagues from Faculty of Medicine, University of Indonesia, and to all other participants of the guest lecture. Please feel free to suggest a topic. Well, maybe I have one. And we hope to see you all again in our next scientific session. Thank you very much and have a good day. You may now leave the webinar. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And this also, I want to uh, talk to Dr. Antuna, no? Oh. One thing. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Antuna, no, Dr. Addis you, also. Yeah. Dr. Dr. Addis, the, our, our, our uh, Master of Ceremony, also uh, has a fellowship from the uh, International Academy of uh, Aviation and Space Medicine and get residency by that uh, yes. scholarship. I was the uh, receiver of the IAS, IASM scholarship back in yeah. 2019. Do me a favor. Do me a favor. Yes. Send me, send me a summary of what you are doing today. All right. When you got the scholarship, and how the scholarship uh, helped you get to where you are today, because sure. I would like to present that in our next session of the council meeting. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Right, I will. Please send that to me. Okay. All right. Very, very talented uh, doctors, Dr. Antunano. So thank you for your scholarship from yeah. yeah so. <laughs> thank you. You were you were still the president back then. I remember. Thank you so much, Dr. Antunano. I'll send you the email. Okay. Sounds great. Well, Dr. Wan, good to see you again. And thank you again. Uh, if you invite okay. me back, I'll cover other topics. Maybe. <laughs> You can uh, give us a guest lecture for every six months, every semester for our student. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a, a, a safe weekend. Mungkin yang di yang di